Hey guys, it's Sig and welcome back to another video. Today we have a clip from a stream that we recently did with two distinguished academics, Dr. Bro Branson and Professor Chris Tweet. With them, we go through the logical problem of the Trinity and the two solutions that both of those individuals supply to the discussion. If you do like content like this, make sure you like, comment and subscribe and turn on notifications to see the next time that we do upload on this channel. And with that being said, away we go. Okay, hello, God bless everyone. Thank you so much for coming into stream, okay? I'm not gonna take too long with the intro because we wanna dive right in. So guys, as you can see on your screens, we have two very nice people. One of them is drinking water, as human beings normally do. The other one is staring menacingly into the screen. Um, we have on our left, uh, Professor Chris Tweet. Chris Tweet is a professor at Newport University. He currently likes epistemology, philosophy of religion, and business ethics. He was an entrepreneur and research analyst before, and now he focuses on teaching business ethics and other philosophy courses. So make sure you do check him out. To my right, we have a very nice esteemed gentleman. He is currently publishing some works which will be down in the description below. A very nice individual. His name is Dr. Bo Branson. He's an assistant professor still at Brescia University. Um, he has certain interests in philosophy of action and philosophy of religion. So if you are interested in those kind of things, guys, once again, make sure you go and check out the content that they do have. Whatever publications they have made will be linked in their websites down below. Do not haggle them, guys. Don't harass them. All love, all support. Now, why are we here today? Well, I was able to haggle these two men into being able to come here so that we could have a very nice, interesting conversation on two solutions that they do provide to the conversation on what we all commonly know as the logical problem of the Trinity. And the solutions that these people, people, that these two bring, I believe are very interesting as well as influential in the spaces and communities that we usually find ourselves in, in these conversations. And so I thought that I'd bring these two guys here today to talk about it. Now, before we get into these two talking instead of me, bear in mind their views are not the same. Um, Chris Twee ultimately argues from a Thomistic view of simplicity and Bo Branson does not. Bo Branson argues through the monarchy of the father as is affirmed in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, especially through the Palamite councils and finalized through the neo-patristic tradition after the sociological era. And so these two ultimately are coming from, uh, we would say different sides of the Christian spectrum, but today they are here to give an account for what both agree as the truth, which they would articulate as the Trinity and thus try to provide a solution um, for the Trinity. So to kick it off ahead, we're going to kick it to Bo. Bo, would you like to start us off? Sure. Let's see. Am I unmuted? You guys can hear me? Yeah. Chat, just make sure. Can you hear him? Oh, apparently I'm way too loud. So I need to put the volume down. Maybe right I'm too close. No, no, you're, you're definitely okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, um, yeah, maybe, maybe as I go through, I kind of have an outline, but I'll, I might make a few comments as I go through mm -hmm. relating it to Chris's paper that I've read and um, maybe just to flag sort of questions or things that, that uh, we might want to talk about. Also, I'll preface it by saying, um, so, you know, in some sense, I come from a, a different angle than Thomism, but in, in certain ways... Um, I do think the Orthodox sort of view is, is a lot closer to Thomism than say a lot of the modern stuff. I mean, I found myself bizarrely in this four views book with William Lane Craig and Bill Hasker. <laughs> and I was the most Thomistic person. In the whole thing. I was, like, I'm like, why am I the Orthodox guy defending like what Aquinas would say? What's, how did that happen? And, and really, to be honest, like um, as I've, gone through, I don't know, as I've gotten older and read more, I, I kind of gradually come to see 
more and more common ground between East and West, actually, um, that I think it, it, in a lot of cases, just kind of has uh, come down to things being articulated in ways that are very different uh, and, and make it sort of on a surface level seem like just crazy opposite views. But actually, I think sometimes the more you, you start to understand the other side, it start to realize there's maybe more common ground, but I'll, but anyway, I'll, I'll go through and, uh, and, uh, just kind of explain my, uh, this is a chapter from a book that's coming out. So I start out by talking a little bit about methodology. <clears throat> so one kind of complaint that I've had about a lot of analytic philosophy in this domain is people will just sort of give a model of the Trinity as they refer to it, which I'm kind of, I have questions about what they even mean by that, but they give a, a model of, of, how the Trinity works or, or some way to kind of articulate the view. <clears throat> and then they just sort of say, well, my model of the Trinity is coherent. Therefore, the doctrine of the Trinity is coherent. And I've argued in a, in a different article that obviously that's a non sequitur. Like you have to say that there's some sort of interesting logical relationship between your model of the Trinity and the doctrine of the Trinity. So Arianism gives us a model of the Trinity, but it, the fact that it's coherent wouldn't show that the doctrine of the Trinity was, or modalism is a, a model of the Trinity. I guess just atheism would be a model of the Trinity, right? Um, so right. so I kind of, uh, and that's one thing I, as re reading through Chris's paper, I kind of at first thought, uh, he's one of these guys who's just kind of, you know, building castles in the air or whatever. But at the end, he, he do he does kind of uh, start tying it into Aquinas. And then I was like, oh, I can see how this um, is is arguably a, a reading, a good reading of Aquinas. So um, mm -hmm. there's some kind of history. I mean, of course, we have to ask whether Aquinas got the church fathers that he was relying on right and everything. But but mm -hmm. anyway, I can I, I wonder if he maybe Chris could comment a little bit on, about whether he uh, sees some kind of historical sort of grounding is necessary. But anyway, if what I've done is just said, well, so that I don't have to worry about this issue, you know, coming up with a model and then sort of trying to connect it to the doctrine of the Trinity later, I say, well, I'm just going to start with something that there can't really be any reasonable controversy about, which would be Gregory of Nyssa's uh, views about the Trinity, which no one I think in their right mind can argue about, but if, if you know anything about the history of it, Gregory of Nyssa was very instrumental in the second ecumenical council. It's really kind of his theology ultimately that most people would say was kind of the mastermind sort of behind the scenes of, of that council. Um, by Roman law, actually, after the second ecumenical council, um, the definition of a Catholic church in Roman law was partly defined in terms of whether you were in communion with Gregory of Nyssa personally. And, mm. you know, he was called on to, uh, you know, there were cases where people's orthodoxy was called into question. And the, what they did was they said, well, we'll send Gregory of Nyssa down to interview you and see whether you're, you know, on the right track. So, so I just start with him and I talk about the other Cappadocian fathers too, and also John of Damascus, who was kind of a later systematizer. Uh, I give uh, a handful of different desiderata for like what a Trinitarian, like a model of the Trinity should do. Um, obviously, <clears throat> there's the kind of obvious objection that the doctrine of the Trinity uh, ends up being three gods. And so you shouldn't get the result that there's three gods. I point out that that really generalizes, though. People don't often notice that it generalizes. There shouldn't be three of a lot of things like savior, creator, mm -hmm. omnipotent. Yeah. Uh, and, and that even becomes a problem for Unitarians in some cases, because the, the father is called our savior, the son's the, called the savior, but the Bible says there's only one savior. And so even if you say Jesus isn't God, it's clear that he's the savior. And so uh, everybody really has to kind of find some way to deal with that. And I don't think Unitarians always do. Uh, another thing I talk about, Dale Tuggy uh, has a kind of different argument. I don't think people always notice that it's a distinct argument. I just call it the who is God problem. <clears throat> um, and that is, uh, he just kind of argues, look, if you go through the New Testament, uh, the word God sort of is substitutable for the word father. Um, and so, um, you know, the kind of the question is why? Like if, if Trinitarians, uh, the sort of standard fare that you, you hear from Trinitarians kind of identifies God with the whole Trinity, social Trinitarians a lot of times do this. It's like, uh, if you're William Lane Craig, God, 
the Trinity is this big three headed dog, but the father, son and spirit are the, the different heads or whatever. Um, and um, so, you know, but that's but, but then why is it that the father is kind of focused on as God in the Bible? Um, so that's something that I think a model needs to kind of have an answer for. Um, and then I talked about the theophany problem, which because in this context of this book, I wanted to kind of make the point that um, a lot of times people portray this as as an issue where like the only thing to be said in favor of the doctrine of the Trinity uh, is just that it's the tradition. Right. And, and that mm -hmm. so it's kind of like the default assumption should be Unitarianism. Uh, or something like that. But, you know, uh, uh, what I want to say is, well, there were reasons why people developed the doctrine of the Trinity and not just kind of the, the sorts of, uh, I think of it as proof texting that happens nowadays where you sort of go right. and say well, places the Bible where it says that, you know, Jesus is God or something. And historically what happened is there was already before Christianity came around in Judaism there was already this kind of anxiety about in the Old Testament, you have this uh, statement that no one can see God and live, but then you have all these theophanies where people see God and they're like, whoa, we saw God and we lived. How did that, <laughs> you know, how did this happen? And so people are trying to figure out, well, how does that work? And so uh, one solution was, well, there's really two powers. So they talk about, people talk today about two powers, theology and ancient Judaism. The idea was sometimes they would say there's an invisible Yahweh and a visible Yahweh or literally big Yahweh, little Yahweh, like mm -hmm. kind of like Yahweh senior and Yahweh junior, which mm -hmm. then you get in the New Testament, father, son. Right. Um, and it, the idea was that Yahweh senior, big Yahweh is invisible. And then there's Yahweh junior, who's the visible Yahweh. And that's kind of what you see in the New Testament, too. But I, I talked about that in a different chapter more. Um, I go through and make some linguistic distinctions. So um, uh, obviously we can use the word God sort of like a name or definite description. So in predicate logic, that'd be like the lowercase um, letter, you know, letters for individuals in normal English should be uppercase. So God like capital G. But sometimes we use God just as a predicate, like Zeus is a God. Um, sometimes it just sort of means like a divine thing or something. Um, and I distinguish between different things that people uh, seem to use the word God to mean as a predicate. Uh, in in one sense, people use the word God uh, more frequently in antiquity than today, but we use the word God to mean like the ultimate source of everything. Uh, and that was really, if you look at early Christian history and Jewish writings from from the first century, like Philo, the, the big concern that people had was to preserve what they called the monarchia, the idea of a sole source, one source of everything. Uh, and so I said, there's one sense of God where it means kind of the ultimate source. Uh, but people also use the word God to mean just a thing that has the divine nature, um, which a nature doesn't necessarily, we can talk about that, but doesn't necessarily entail having the same nature as God might not entail being the source of everything. Um, and then sometimes Gregory Nyssa argues, sometimes it just means a thing that performs a certain kind of activity. Uh, and he thinks that's really how it's used in the in the Bible. He thinks when uh, when you have these claims like God stands in the midst of the gods uh, and he judges the gods, um, mm. uh, that the gods who have not created the heavens and the earth perish. Uh, the gods of the Gentiles are demons. There's all these other things that are being called gods, but he says those don't have the divine nature. They just there's a certain kind of activity that they're uh, that they're able to perform just mm -hmm. like the, the one God. When the scripture talks about the one God, Gregory Nyssa thinks it's talking about the source of of everything. So a couple of um, bits of theology to kind of um, uh, tie these things together. So. Um, First, Gregory and all the Cappadocians and John of Damascus take the Father to be the source in some sense of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, and so does Aquinas uh, and Augustine. Um, mm. So uh, in Latin, it's the you know, principium sine principium, the principle without principle. And in Greek, the arche and arcos. And right. so what I point out is if you're talking about, and they, it, so like in the Creed, it says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. 
And Basil famously says to people that accused him of tritheism, he says, there's only one God because there's only one father. So in that sense, they're using the word God to mean the ultimate source. And because they believe in the eternal generation and procession, um, they're able to say, yeah, there is just one God in the sense of the monarchia, right, that everyone was concerned to preserve. Mm. Um, so uh, the another issue that I talk about is uh, just kind of we talk, uh, well, so just that issue that uh, of the theophanies, right? So just uh, you already had in Judaism this idea that there's what I call a theophany figure that was something distinct from, you know, the God that you can't see. And basically in Christianity, people just sort of plug Jesus in as that figure, right? So mm. in some hands of Judaism, it's like an angel like Yahuwah or Metatron. Some people thought it was Michael, the archangel, uh, maybe an exalted human like Enoch or something. But in Christianity, it just becomes Jesus. And I point out that we sometimes refer to a representation of a thing as though it just were that thing. So we'll say... Right parked outside well it's really it's my car that's parked outside um or i some like you know there's a interesting dissertation about dungeons and dragons and stuff where people just <laughs> refer to uh, people refer to their characters with the right. word I. the dissertation the title of the dissertation is i rolled a one and then i died where oh. obviously the word i the word i first refers to me right mm. and then second it refers to my character Right, right. So there's, uh, there's a lot of cases where Jesus is just referred to as God, like capital G, like the name. And I, mm. and Basil says this, that that's like pointing to a picture of the emperor and saying that's the emperor. Mm. Um, we point to, and Christ is the icon of God, the icon of the Father. So we can point at Jesus and say that's God because he's the, the image of God. I see. Um so I think that at, uh, I, I talk a little bit about, um, I guess I'll say something about quantities that probably will come up uh, in, mm. in the discussion too. So one, uh, so how, how does this solve the three gods problem? Well, if we're talking about God in the sense of an ultimate source, it's the monarchy of the father. Right. Uh, if we're talking about God in the sense of nature or action, um, I just point out that in antiquity, people thought of quantity and number differently than we do today. Um, so mm. today we just think that to say there are two F's is to say there's an X and a Y and X is F and Y is F and X and Y are not identical. And we mm -hmm. just take that out of the definition of the number two. Or, um, <clears throat> really, all the way up until Frege, um, uh, people continue, like Mill has this view. Um, mm. And Aristotle articulates this, and um, I will I will argue that Aquinas uh, talks mm. about this. Right, the trend <laughs> right, is right, right. What, uh, Chris wants to push back on that, but mm. uh, but the idea was more that um, uh, numbers are uh, let's say structural universals that are exhibited by aggregates. So I in see. particular, in in Aristotle, you get this idea that uh, to say that there's two or three or whatever, or to say it is to say that there are these things that don't share a common boundary. Um, that's how he defines discrete quantities or discrete right. pluralities of things is they don't. Uh, so, so just as an example, uh, hopefully this isn't sensitive information. So if I have one piece of paper, Aristotle would say, this is one piece of paper because all the parts kind of, you, you know, they're all together. Right. But mm -hmm. Now it's two pieces of paper, right? Because right, this doesn't right. share any parts with this and they don't share a common boundary. So they're mm -hmm. divided. So they thought about uh, quantity in terms of division. And so uh, Gregory of Nyssa would say, uh, uh, there's not three gods because the nature is not divided uh, and uh, the activities aren't divided. So the, the doctrine of inseparable operations uh, he relies mm -hmm. on. So I, I hope that that... Uh, pretty much covers um, pretty much. And that, that kind of extends to the, the three of everything problem, right? There's not two saviors mm. because the act of salvation isn't divided. Um, right. Right. And I think that's all. So I think I, I probably took more time than I should have. So I'll, I'll <laughs> shut up there and see, nah, see okay. uh, Chris can enlighten me. Uh, mm. on, on. Well, Chris, you are up. 
Okay. And he's going to be talking about his, we, we say solution, but his understanding of the Trinity through opacity. And so, Chris, without me saying anything, away you go. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, so, Sig, do you want me to summarize my paper? Well, yeah, here's what I'll do. I'll do the same thing that Bo did. So yeah. I'll summarize uh, my paper and, and discuss some interactions with Bo's paper as I go along. Yeah, of course. Um, so first of all, I am not by trade a historian, um, <laughs> but I, I am familiar with Aquinas and his theology. And um, it that was the basis for writing this paper as I was reading Aquinas on the Trinity I uh, I read in Aquinas a solution that I hadn't read in uh, contemporary analytic theology. And so mm. I decided to write the paper describing what I thought was Aquinas's view. And I began the paper um, arguing for a solution to this logical problem of the Trinity without referring to Aquinas, just so I could establish it. Um, my audience isn't necessarily Thomists. My audience mm. is analytic theologians, not of all whom are Thomists. So I wrote it that way with contemporary analytic tools, and then I incorporated it, um, or I, sh I showed how I think it's Aquinas' view later on. Uh, I, like Bo, am not a fan of models of the Trinity, um, mm. not, not, not necessarily for Bo's reasons, but because I think they all fail for some reason or another. Um, the Trinity is a, a you know, a, a mystery that can't be uh, described using something like concrete objects um, as we do. Um, and for, uh, as I was uh, hearing Bo talk and as I've, I've read his chapter, I was, um, uh, one thing that might be helpful for people, or audience members who are contemporary analytic theologians, is that counting by division just seems like counting by numerical sameness according to the numerical sameness without identity view. So on that view, you might have one pillar that is also a statue mm. and, uh, you know, and it's also like a bunch of clay uh, wow. and it might have a color and that may be four different objects because they all have different properties. And so there's mm. four non-identical things occupying the same hunk of matter, but it's undivided matter. So it counts as a numerical same, they're, they're numerically the same. And so mm. if you by division, you're going to count numerically the same objects as one. And so it seems like this counting by division or counting by identity is numerical sameness versus identity. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear both thought about that. Um, uh, I do not talk about theophany in my paper. I uh, consider uh, uh, the tritheism issue as one of the issues. That's what I call the second problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. Um, I do not in my paper discuss what it means to be God. I take it to be an individual um, of the divine nature, though. And this is falling in line with uh, you know, typical analytic uh, theology and also Aquinas. So on Aquinas's view, God is uh, distinguished from all the created things by virtue of being pure actuality. Right. Everything else potentiality mm -hmm. and so there is a unique being that is pure act and that being gets the name god mm -hmm. and there's a question about which of the persons of the trinity gets the name god <laughs> right, in the right. pure sense mm -hmm. uh, and the idea is that the father son and holy spirit all get that attribution all get that get the name attributed to them mm -hmm. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God, but they're not identical to one another. So it seems like there are three gods, um, which is a denial of monotheism. Um, and then the first problem um, is a problem that the Father and the, um, the Son are both identical to God. And what's ever identical to one, th the same or identical to each other. Each other. Right, right. The Son. So the the first problem collapses the persons and denies the distinctness. Mm. Uh, the second problem denies the oneness of God to make mm -hmm. there be three gods. Mm. Um, the first one identifies. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't want to belabor that point. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, do, do what you need to. It's fine. In the uh, paper, I bring up two ish uh, possible solutions to these problems. And um, I argue that they both fail for some reason or another. 
and my reasons for their failure are not unique. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I'm just flashing stuff from the literature here. So um, right, right. one solution is the social Trinitarian solution, which is to say um, that the is is an is of predication. So uh, it's belonging to a type that is God. So the father belongs to the type that is God. Um, the son belongs to the type that is God. Uh, it doesn't, it, by doing that, you don't identify the father with the son. Um, they are distinct uh, individuals, distinct persons. And so you don't have the problem that the first problem is, you, the first problem is not present, it's solved. Mm -hmm. um, but the tritheism problem remains. And this has been a pretty common critique of social Trinitarianism mm -hmm. that it's difficult to um, escape. To, uh, yeah, difficult to escape that problem. Mm. Uh, the, the other one is the relative identity solution. And this is uh, like Peter Van Wagen's solution. Uh, so according to this solution, um, to say that X is Y is ill-formed, we need to specify it, it is the same what as Y. Um, you need to know how to count. And so you can count by persons or you can count by gods, for example. And you can also count by passengers and count by humans and count by bottles and count by papers. And so there's, there's just multiple ways of counting. And the is specifies that there's one thing that's counted, but you want to know what you're counting by. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you say the father is God, that is unspecified. You need to say something like the father is the same God as God. And if you say the father is the son, you need to say whether you're saying the father is the same God as the son or the father is the same person as the son. And once you make those specifications, both problems are solved. Mm -hmm. So the first problem, you can say the father is the same God as God. The son is the same God as God. But it doesn't follow. And it, it does follow that the father is the same God as the son. That's fine. Uh, but it doesn't follow that the father is the same person as the son, which would be problematic. Mm -hmm. For the second problem, you can say uh, the father is the same God as God. Uh, the um, son is the same God as God. Um, the Holy Spirit is the same God as God. And then you can say the father is not the same person as the son. Right. The son is not the same person as the Holy Spirit. And the father is not the same person as the Holy Spirit. And you don't get the conclusion that there are three gods. You get the conclusion that there are three persons. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to endorse the problematic conclusion. So it solves both of the problems. But the problem with the relative identity solution is that we want to be able to count by things or by beings or by individuals or entities. We just want to be able to count. And uh, so, and that possibility is, um, is belied by the relative identity solution. Uh, if we allow you to count by things, then we should need, we should be able to say um, X is the same thing as Y. And if we do that, then uh, is it true that the father is the same thing as God and the son is the same thing as God? Therefore, the father is the same thing as the son. And that's the problem. That's the same as the first problem. So once you allow counting just by things or by entities or individuals, we're faced with the same problems again. And so you might think it's uh, not, uh, I mean, at least it's it's a check mark in the con column to have a mm -hmm. view that doesn't allow you to count by individuals. Mm -hmm. There's no, it's not like there's a set reality that has a certain number of things right. in it. Any, um, mm -hmm. It's almost like you just have to specify the thing you're going to count by. There aren't just things in the world. Um and I present the numerical same with the sameness without identity view. I'm going to skip it for now mm -hmm. um, and for time and just talk briefly about my view. Um, mm -hmm. So I want, I want to be able to endorse, as I think a lot of people do, that when you say the father is the son, you're, you're, the is is an is of identity. It's not an is of predication. You can straightforwardly say is um, without having to specify the thing that you're counting by. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to do that. But the problem is you get these conclusions that, um, are anathema to a contemporary um, Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. So um, what, I, what I propose is that there are certain rules that sometimes allow you to do the substitutions in those arguments and sometimes don't. And, right. and that's because even with identity statements, sometimes you can't have certain 
substitutions because there are opaque contexts within those sentences. And so the, the paper then spells out where those opaque contexts exist and what sort of substitutions are allowed on the basis of those opaque contexts. And in short, the idea is that, um, so let's, let's fast forward, I guess, to, to Aquinas now, and then we'll go back to the opaque contexts. The idea is that when you start specifying a thing, you're specifying some sort of foundation or basis. Mm. And so if you specify God, just as God, now you're specifying the thing that has the divine nature, the thing that is pure act. And that does not have a basis that is at all opposed to the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will all be God. So you can say the Father is God, and that's true. Uh, now, if you specify the Father and start talking about the Father, well, the Father is something that has a relational opposition to the other persons. In fact, what it means to be a person is to be distinct, to be in some sort of relational opposition. Mm -hmm. So if you specify the father, you're specifying something that has relational opposition to the son and which has relational opposition to the Holy Spirit. Right. And so anything that is particularly uh, has its, that has particularly has its basis in the father is going to in some way be opposed to what has its basis in the son. The son. Right, right. So the, the, all of the Trinitarian problems take something, uh, identify the father with something, and then take the son and identify it with something, and then try to identify them with each other. But when we do that, we're taking things that have different bases, and we're trying to, to put them together in the problematic conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so the context specify when that sort of thing can be done. So when there is something that has its basis in a divine person, you can't substitute into it something that has its basis in another divine person. Mm. If you prevent that kind of substitution, you don't have the problematic conclusions. So you, you can't say the father is God and the son is God. Therefore, the father is the son because you're substituting into something, God, the pure act being that, mm. you know, um, starting off with the bases being the father and the son. Um, so that's the first solution. Uh, this doesn't map on perfectly to the second conclusion or the second problem, I'm sorry, because in the second problem, we're now talking about the father is a God and the son is a God, meaning a thing that has the divine nature. Um, but if you endorse divine simplicity, then there's a straightforward solution. So uh, according to divine simplicity, to be a God is just to be identical to God, the one pure act being. Mm -hmm. And so now the father is God, the son is God, uh, the Holy Spirit's God, and uh, uh, the father is not the son. But if we're going to try to create a contradiction out of the premises that make up that second uh, problem, you're going to have to do the substituting that isn't allowable via these mm -hmm. new. So uh, if you have simplicity for the second problem, that makes it so that to be a God is just to be God, mm. the individual, then, uh, then the same sort of solution applied to solving prim uh, problem one can be applied to solving problem two. Right, right, right. That is really interesting. That, that's a quick summary of, mm. of, my article happy to hear that thank you so much for watching this video guys if you did like the content make sure you like comment and subscribe and turn on notifications to see the next time that we upload i usually am live on twitch so if you do want to catch the content make sure you catch me on twitch make sure you follow the socials and like always have a better day than me